Thanks, Katrina. Okay, um, so I'm the Secretary for Science and Technology Australia. I'm also the Deputy Head for the School of Natural Sciences at Griffith University in Brisbane and a proud member of the Genetic Society of Australasia, a member of, of STA. The morning's chair session is uh, chaired by Kylie Walker and we'll be going through Meet the Media, a day in the life of a journalist. So I'll invite the, the panel to come up. Just while they're coming up, I'll introduce Kylie and then I'll let her, uh, her introduce the, the panel. Kylie is the Director for Communications and Outreach at the Australian Academy of Sciences, where she oversees external and internal communication strategy. Have you come back? Oh, okay, no worries. Um, Kylie's uh, also got more than 10 years uh, experience as a journalist and worked in the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery. So with that, um, I'll let Kylie introduce the, the, the panel. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Um, I may have been in the press gallery some time ago, but I certainly haven't got the kind of political reporting chops that my two panellists uh, and colleagues here today have. Um, we are, I'm here today with Alison Carabine, who I'm sure you are all familiar with from RN Breakfast. Um, I have heard Fran Kelly describe her as the person who makes the show. I have to agree, Ali. Um, I'm to blame. I, I, I think I am to tell you that she is a former elite athlete who, <laughs> <laughs> who gave up I a fabulous sporting career <laughs> for journalism. Uh, Paul Bongiorno, of course, also requires uh, very little introduction, I'm sure. He's been a journalist almost as long as I've been alive. Um, <laughs> one for Walkley's. He's a contributing editor for 10 News, a columnist for the Saturday paper, and a regular commentator for RN Breakfast. So I might just sort of bow out now and let these two banter. <laughs> uh, now, we heard a little bit from, uh, from Brian Schmidt about how you might most effectively engage the media as well as politicians. And I guess we're here to help this morning. We want to demystify a little bit about the, the media and the news cycle and how best to, uh, to have your voice heard amongst the cacophony. And we'd also like to talk a little bit about how politics and the media work hand in hand um, and, and what that means for you in terms of uh, having your voice heard and your issues raised. Um, I guess I'd like to start with uh, perhaps exploring how politicians use the media for their own advantage and, you know, or, or otherwise, I guess, that how successful they are. Um, Ali, would you like to kick off? Well, I, I, I guess without the media, politicians would find it very difficult to uh, not necessarily do their jobs but to be seen to be doing their jobs and that's the key for any politician. I mean what's the point of doing anything good if no one's seeing you do that good and of course it's the media that is able to uh, portray what a politician is doing but of course it's a, a double-edged sword for a politician. They covet coverage by the media but only when it suits them. I um, mean, there's quite a distinct difference between how much a politician will want to uh, have a relationship with a program, for example, like RN Breakfast, when they're on the way up, but when they're at the top, that's when uh, they become a little bit more difficult to, to entice onto the program because they, they have to be a lot more careful about what they say. But it is a, uh, a, 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 a relationship, a very close relationship between politicians and with the media. We need them, they need us. I once had this argument with Tony Abbott before he was Prime Minister where he was insisting that we need them more than, than they need us, but that's not true. I think a politician needs, needs a, uh, a platform much more than we need them because there's a million stories out there in the fat city. Mm. Now, Paul, does it always work in the politician's favour uh, when they are courting the media? Obviously, they're using it as a method of communicating with constituents. Look, um, uh, I think we should um, give, give the discussion a bit of context from this point of view that when you're talking to me and indeed to Alison, you're talking to two members of the parliamentary, the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery, which, which, you know, which, which has um, a role in reporting uh, via mainstream media outlets uh, uh, to, to the nation about what the nation's political parties and parliament are doing. But what I've noticed, and when we say media today, uh, all the media, 
and uh, Ellison's medium particularly does this extremely well, are multi-platform. Um, and, of course, one of the things that the um, politicians are aware of today, that access to mainstream media, that is, one of the commercial television networks' um, bureaus or the ABC or SBS or, or the newspapers, um, also gives them access to the, to the platforms that are also being, uh, being used. The next thing to say is that, um, that we're in a 24-hour, 24-7 news cycle, and, and um, you know, what goes uh, on that news cycle is changing. However, um, what you've got to understand is that, that it's the story of the day or the stories of the day in descending order that will appeal to the broadest possible audience. Um, so politicians then go home from Canberra, except the ones who represent Canberra, and they then have the uh, access, uh, especially regional uh, politicians, to their local media as an outlet and as a way of uh, communicating. And of course, we mustn't forget uh, uh, that social media is now intruding and making, uh, you know, making its presence felt. Now, the relationship between um, politicians and us as journalists, as particularly in the gallery, that, for example, uh, at, at 10, we're looking for the main political story of the day, and any other stories that might pop, pop up could be uh, of human interest, um, could be of some sort of importance with an emphasis to entertainment rather than information. And, and so um, w what often does happen, the tax story is now running, if you wanted to use the media well and you had an axe to grind and you maybe didn't want to be a minister, you might come onto the doors in the morning where the cameras are and get stuck into the Prime Minister for not doing what you want him to do. That would get you a run if you're a Liberal backbencher, it would probably mean that you've got an agenda that doesn't fit in with the Prime Minister's. But that would suit the, that would suit the media just fine, because what we need is colour and movement. Mm -hmm. And there's always that tension between the colour and movement and entertaining, whether they're television viewers or radio listeners, or alternatively doing what is a substantial, worthy story. Now, mm. even on the ABC, we're not in the business of turning people off. We want listeners, we want to rate. So it's always a juggle trying to find that right balance between informing our listeners but also not boring them to tears. We are the ABC. So we do that quite well on occasion. But fortunately, the program I work on, we're two and a half hours a day. So it's two and a half hours a day of solid programming. So there's, a, there's much more scope than there would be, for example, on the 10 News Bulletin each day to try and provide a, a, a variety of political coverage. Now, and Alison, Paul mentioned that 10am 10, 10 imperative, and I imagine that's the case for, for much of the media. Is that the same for you? You would have a very different timetable, I'd imagine. Well, uh, we go to air at 6am, and uh, you know, I think to an extent that the, the media cycle, although it has changed considerably in recent years, you still have the basic bedrock, be uh, uh, building blocks of a media day. Newspapers break stories, uh, radio, Radio do the, the you know the, the significant interviews, which also help kickstart the day, and then of course television news, which is now 24/7. They still do the wrap of the day at at five o'clock five o'clock on Channel 10. So that's that's the uh, I guess the timetable that we work to. But because there is now so many media platforms, the ABC by itself it has local radio, it has AM, it has news radio, it has news breakfast television, it has a 24-hour television network, it has RN Breakfast. There is such red-hot competition for the key interviews of the day, in particular the political interviews of the day, that the, the day just doesn't end. It's, it's, it's a, it's really is a 24-7 lifestyle. Media, it's interesting, the media does feed on itself and, and um, even though now, for example, all the print media like the Australian, the Fairfax Papers, um, the Murdoch Papers, uh, are still using paper and ink. Uh, they're all online, and um, you know the, the news editor of the day or the chief of staff will look across those networks to see what is the big story that is running, uh, and, and um, uh, you know look look if it's big enough to follow 
uh, to follow it or to add to it, um, you know, rather than hear off uh, in, in another direction. Um, for years at uh, Channel 10, it was said that the, the Daily Tele Telegraph was Channel 10's five o'clock news daily rundown. <laughs> <laughs> and there is uh, some truth in that. Uh, but, but what you all have to understand is that every outlet and every program uh, has a particular audience in mind. Um, the three commercial television users um, have a, a very broad audience in mind uh, that seems to um, want and thrive on crime, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, mm -hmm. uh, which can be uh, uh, which, which can be a bit um, disconcerting if you're a serious political journalist. I, I think so. I think it's a it's a little bit more varied than that. I mean, I, I think people do love the sex and rock and roll approach to news gathering. But I think they also want to, something more substantial. They want to know who is running the country today and um, whether or not they're doing a good job. So it's a bit like a, a well-balanced diet. Sure, you want your chips and your gravy, but you also got to have your veggies on the side. So, so with that 24-7 news cycle and with that proliferation of, of platforms and, and that, therefore that, that potential for a huge breadth of, of coverage, both in type and, and in style and in depth, um, and content indeed. What is it that makes a story sing? How, how does a story rise above all of that, that potential kind of morass, and become the big story of the day or the week? Well, that's a very good question because um, what uh, leads a bulletin one day might be lucky to make a bulletin on, the, on another day, depending on what's around. Um, there used to be uh, a saying uh, for 10 news and 7 and 9, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, but what, what does make a story uh, is a really good discussion. I mean, why is it that of, of the thousands of, of uh, refugees that were fleeing, um, you know, Iraq and Syria, that the, that, that the image of the drowned boy grabbed the world? You know, there have been many other desperate images. Why did that particular uh, image all of a sudden uh, become the image that everybody around the world, including in Australia, on every pla news platform in Australia. It's, it's a hard question to answer, frankly. Uh, there's no doubt that human interest, human identification, um, uh, you know, ha has a lot to, to do with it. In your area of science, science breakthroughs interest people. We're all hypochondriacs. <laughs> we all want to know, um, you know, am I going to get the big C? And if I do, can I survive? Uh, we're all interested in um, knowing the latest things in, in the health area. We're all interested to know uh, if someone's discovered a life form in the universe. All of those sorts of things, you know, are newsworthy, you know. Uh, but but um, one day you might come up with a story in your particular area that people put on the spike. They used to put it on the spike. I don't think they do anymore. They probably put it in a bin That's somewhere. Email know. boxes. Email boxes. Spike, I think. And, and you never know your luck. You know, three weeks later, um, someone's scratching around and they say, oh, I remember someone, you know, did this. I wonder if it's still around and, and give you a call. So um, that's not... It, one thing about the news business, it's not a precise business. No, no, <laughs> not at all. But to bring it back, your question, Kylie, back to the area we work in and politics, I think what we look for is anything that seems to be counterintuitive. Uh, a politician saying something uh, against party policy, uh, Greens doing a deal with the government on Senate voting reform. Uh, that, that might be a contemporary example. But I think one of the observations that I would make having been in the press gallery for about 22 years, is that very, very little happens that really surprises people. Everyone is so predictable. The parties are predictable. Policies are predictable. And in my time in the gallery, about the, the one time where we all went, oh, my God, did that actually happen? And we're going back a fair few years. It's when Cheryl Curnow defected from the Democrats and joined the Labor Party. Now, nobody, nobody apart from Gareth Evans saw that, <laughs> saw that coming at all. Uh, even, I mean, we've been talking a lot about child sex abuse with George Pell's uh, testimony in Rome, and I was thinking about Peter Hollingworth. Even when he resigned as Governor General, which is an incredible story, 
I remember when we finally got confirmation from Government House and it was just, oh yeah, he's gone, because it was so anticipated, it was so expected. Elections are expected. We kind of know mostly what are in budgets. Leadership changes are expected, especially when you're you know, within that hermetically sealed hot house of Parliament House. So what does make a story? I think when we're, you're that close to it, you kind of lose the ability to actually identify what be, might be of interest to those who live outside the Beltway. But very few things happen that truly surprise you. Mm. So do those manufactured surprises, are they obvious? Do they turn you off? Are there, are there great controversial or exciting stories that, that do still take you genuinely by surprise? Well, look, there's still an awful lot to be interested and engaged by with politics because there's 150 MPs and 75 senators. So there's, that, there's a lot of personal stories, a lot of different personalities, and of course, lots and lots and lots of different agendas being run. So there's still enough for Paul and I to make a living out of it. I, I want to come around to science in a moment, but before we leave politics, I want to ask you about, uh, both of you, about what your view is uh, of the role of question time. And, and I suspect that's changed over the life of the parliament from, from compared with the time where it wasn't broadcast, uh, that it was perhaps um, a genuine opportunity to, to question and to, to raise issues of well, concern. Question, question Time's got many audiences. I don't think people quite realise this. One of the most important audiences in Question Time is actually the backbench of the government of the day. The, the Prime Minister and the Ministers are performing more for them than for anyone else. There are then other audiences. Of course, you then have the rules absolutely stacked against uh, genuine questions from the opposition and the opposition being able to pursue them. The next reality is that everybody in question time, whether they're the government or the opposition, are in there for the theatre of it. They're in there to play politics. That's what they're in there for. They're not in there to give any real information out there to the electorate. If that happens, that's a bonus. They're really in there to show uh, their own backbenchers, but particularly for the government, the government backbench, that we're on top of it. We're, we're, we've got the opposition where we want them, and, and, and you know, we're, we're winning. The opposition's in there to show that the government's failing. It's the worst government since Federation, if not earlier. And, 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 um, uh, uh, and that um, uh, you know, we're making some headway. So you've got to understand the theatre of it. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty important. I just want to share one thing with you, and I know I'm hogging the limelight just for half a second. I was the president of the gallery committee when uh, Bob Hawke caved into pressure from, uh, from the gallery that we should stop thinking that it was 1942 and radio, or the wireless, had just been admitted to the parliament and admit that we've got television. And in, what we used to have to do was run a, an audio grab out of the parliament with a still slide of the speaker. And the gallery committee said, this is getting ridiculous, and Hawke agreed, but Paul Keating didn't. Paul Keating said, oh, I don't want television cameras in question time. And the real reason why I didn't want it is because people would see what he was like out there. And while it would thrill many, it would turn many more off, and he was right. And then, uh, so they had all sorts of rules, what you couldn't broadcast, you know, and what you could. But there is no doubt that the televising of the parliament um, absolutely changed the perceptions of, uh, of what people do in it. And Keating was probably right. The, 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 access, uh, the access casts a very strong light uh, spotlight on, on the performers. Yeah, well, don't forget Paul Keating when he was Prime Minister. <clears throat> excuse me, cut back his appearances in question time for that very reason. Now, I've only been in Parliament since about 1644. Paul's been there since the 1300s. So he remembers <laughs> when question time was a kind of gentler place and there did seem to be a genuine effort to try and extract information. It used to be that you would closely listen to question time because you might get a story nowadays that doesn't happen. Televising has helped it become a platform to promote personalities promote agendas, but it still does serve a, 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 re a good function. Just recently, we've had two ministers resign, Malbruff and Stuart Robert, no, no doubt because of the pressure 
the sustained pressure that was applied in a court-like situation day after day after day by the Labor Party. So that's one very good usage, decent usage of question time. So I do want to ask you a question because you've both talked about performance and theatre and I think that really is um, kind of the essence of what I was trying to get at. That everybody in this room, or most people in this room over the next couple of days are going to go and meet with politicians one or one. They're going to have a conversation with a human being. Uh, then they're going to see question time and they'll see a completely different side to that person. Can you, can you talk us through why that is? Well, I think it's because I, I recall uh, an esteemed colleague of mine by the name of Paul Bongiorno once explaining to me the whole concept of loyalty in politics, that loyalty is very fine. It's a very fine human attribute, being loyal to your friends, your family, your football team or whatever. But in politics, the overriding po loyalty is to your party. That, that overcomes all other considerations. And I think that might take us to why people behave they way, the way they do in, in Parliament, because it's a gladiatorial contest. It's two teams lining up in a grand final, and they, they, they believe they cannot give an inch. And you will find that politicians behind the scenes, they're just like the rest of us. They're like any other workforce. You've got your exceptional workers, You've got your flogs down the bottom and then you've got this mass of people in the media who, who do, a, do a good job day in, day out. And that's, I'm sure, how you'll find most politicians up on the hill. Now, I, I want to move to science. Uh, there was an announcement late last year of a, a bold new national innovation and in science agenda. Uh, it was made by the Minister's own omission on the back of only 10 weeks' work. Um, was it all gloss and promise, or do you see some depth in it? Was it an attempt to quiet a, a, an increasingly noisy science sector, or do you see uh, some potential there for some genuine work to be done? Well, first of all, I think people in this room would be able to answer that question better than us. But it's clear that you can't take millions of dollars out of science and science research and, and then talk about how you want us all to be clever. Uh, the, other, the other point, too, is that... Um, you know, and, I, and I, I would hope that we could get the uh, political discussion back around to um, not just talk about spending, but talk about investing. And, and, and that's why I think, uh, for example, um, the funding of education from bubs right through is an investment in education, in science uh, uh, and knowledge, knowledge and science. You know, So look, uh, there's, there's a, there are, without a doubt, a lot of smoke and mirrors. I, I suspect that the current Prime Minister is far more inclined to be sympathetic to uh, considered scientific evidence than the previous Prime Minister. At least that's my hope, um, and, and for the good of the nation, frankly. Um, uh, so um, yes, at least the national conversation is paying due deference to the work that people in this room are doing. That's a hell of a lot better than thinking that anyone who's a scientist is a dickhead because they vote Labor. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the level of it, you know. That's the level of it. If you've got a brain, you must be a political opponent. So, um, yeah, that's my frippin' sapenies worth. I, I want to come to you, Alison, but first, just uh, I will ask you all to, to please, invite you all to please ask questions if you have them. So please <laughs> pop up your hand and a mic will come to you. Alison? Yeah, look, I've only got, a, I guess, a short contribution to make. Uh, I, I think it definitely does help that we have a Prime Minister who I think is genuinely engaged in this particular area. And I think there is an, an increasing awareness of the economic dividends that scientific development can engender. And coming back to my own workspace, RN Breakfast, we certainly recognise the value of science and science stories. Now, the, the bedrock of our program, politics, business and economics, international relations and science. Mm. And we always get substantial hits on our science story because it's interesting. Yeah, and RN generally is actually very good at reporting science, I have found, as someone who's always trying to get science into the news. Um, I, one more question from me and then I promise I'll hand over to the floor. Uh, Alison, you do a bit of science reporting. What is the one mistake, the one, oh, it doesn't have to be the one. What, what is a mistake that you see scientists make over and over again when they're engaging with the media? Well, I don't think they engage enough with the media. I think that's the, the main mistake that I see. I mean, there's got to be, I can't, can't even imagine how many interesting scientific 
research projects which are underway at the moment. And unfortunately, it just seems to be the big bang um, intergalactic stories that are getting up these days because there's just not enough communication between the scientific world and a person like myself. Now, my advice, and it's really just common sense, a person like me, I would get bombarded each and every day with at least 200 emails, most of them from politicians, most of them are never going to see the light of day. So you've got to find an engaging, direct, very simple way, very simplistic way of dealing with someone like myself who is a scientific Luddite. And if I don't understand what the hell you're on about, there's no chance that our listeners will have either. Now that's just basic communications 101. Thank you. There's a question at the back. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I'm a conservation biologist, I'm interested in the environment. It seems to me that the environment has very much slipped off the agenda um, in Australia. And I was, my question to you is how much do you think the media shapes public opinion, um, vice versa? Should we be trying to use the media to get the environment back on the agenda? And how would you suggest we do that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that just takes us to the general role that the media play in the country. And yeah, I think the media does help shape perceptions about an issue as important as the environment, the love media, the ABC and Fairfax, as opposed to the hate media, <laughs> News Limited, on the issue of climate change. I mean, it's, you know, there's, a, a, I think, a fairly crystal clear example of the way in which perceptions have been have well, I actually take exception to um, the basis of the question because I don't agree with it. I actually think the environment has been making and is making news all the time uh, from extreme weather to the, the, the debate over, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, mine, you know, um, God, it's gone out of my head. It was Chinois and, you know, um, uh, fracking and all that sort of thing. You know, it, 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 it is a live discussion. Um, the, the thing that is mind-boggling to me is how the whole issue, for example, of climate change has, uh, has become more one of religion than of science. And, and, and how uh, the, the, the debate in America with the American right has infected the Australian right or elements of it, whereby um, um, you know, you're either a believer or a not. Well, I'm not, I don't believe in climate change. I accept the science of it. So yeah. how, how yeah. do we counter that, the language of belief? Is it simply by using the language of fact instead? Well, uh, well the other reality, of course, is that, uh, that politics and political attitudes, are, like religion, are shaped as much by emotion as they are, and this is something we all should realise, as they are by int intellectual fine argument. Um, uh, it's interesting, just briefly, that, that some research has been done. How do we get the message out that there is such a thing as anthropogenic global warming and therefore uh, the anthropos, the man and the woman, the human beings, can do something to alleviate it? And um, apparently uh, research done up at the University of Queensland uh, showed that if you paint a doomsday scenario, people um, get under the doona and start sucking their thumb. They don't want to know. <laughs> But if you talk about clean energy, a clean environment, safe air to breathe, people uh, start relating to that. And so the very things you need to do to do that are the very things you do need to do to also begin to ameliorate our contribution to global warming. Mm. Uh, we have a question at the front. Sure. Uh, my question is about uh, the interaction between the inherent uncertainty of some science and the very black and white political debate where things must be one way or the other. You know, if we're reporting a science thing, it, it's within a level of confidence, there's a certain outcome to it. How does one translate that inherent uncertainty into a political type of climate? Mm. Well, I, I guess you've always got to try and give both sides of the argument. Not quite equal space. I mean, I guess climate change is a good example of it. If I, I, I don't know the figure, but if 99% of the world's climate scientists believe that there is anthropogenic global warming, then my humble brain's not one to disagree with that. And so you would always give 
uh, a predominance to those views rather than the Lord Monctons of the world. But occasionally you do have to interview Lord Moncton. Unfortunately, he will front up with all the arguments and, and uh, you know, all the, 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 the Delphic way he portrays climate change and how it doesn't actually exist. And you'll never win an argument with the man. But you've just got to be careful at always getting that balance because you can't make it a 50-50 because it's not a 50-50 argument. No, I did see one, uh, one sketch which I thought was rather good where they sort of attempted to get balance into the climate change debate. They had 99 scientists and one denier. I think that's pretty much the, the appropriate balance, I would yeah, say, that we Yeah, and you'll come up me. against the Alan Joneses of the world yeah, who right. scream the loudest. They do. Well, um, you know, th that's where the debate then also has to come down to the uh, exposition the revelation of the vested interest that's in there, you know, the, and um, you know we saw what the vested interest of big tobacco did for decades and decades of the issue of smoking. Well, the vested interest of fossil fuels is doing exactly the same. It's parallel now, uh, but 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 in the end, you have to keep hitting your head against the wall. You might get some bruises, but but my firm belief is the wall will crack, mm. or the world will end. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever comes yes. first. <laughs> it certainly does take some time. There's a question at the back here. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Rob Agus from the Australian Synchrotron. I uh, just wanted to pick up on a couple of points that um, Matthew said in his uh, previous talk and get your comment on them as well. He was talking about the uh, response to unscientific commentary and discourse and, and um, what do you think is the best approach to take with that? Is it really that we need more <laughs> engagement? Um, do we need more of the, the colour and movement that you spoke about, Paul? And, and is there really an effective way to, to counter these unscientific arguments um, in, in an effective way? Because if facts and, and reality were going to get the job done, I think this wouldn't be an argument. Paul? Oh, yeah, OK. Um, well, no, you... you Look, you, you, first of all, you've got to stay in the marketplace. You, know, you, you can't um, you know, just retire you know, to, to back into academia and close the door and suck your own stuff, as it were. You, know, you, you, you have to engage. You know. and, and, and also, we shouldn't confuse rabid, loud minority views with broad community acceptance of, of realities. Uh, well, another thing to understand is like someone like an Ellen Jones, he does have influence, but his audience is quite small. You know? When they turned up with um, the Ditch the Witch people, you know, when Gillard was Prime Minister, on climate change, if you looked around and saw that clutch of older, uneducated, rabid people who were there, that's his audience. And, and they're not the audience whose votes even really count on, on election day, you know? Uh, and that's, so, that's so something... Paul, are you suggesting we just ignore them? No, no, I, you have to stay in the marketplace. You have to put uh, arguments out there. You have to be available to, you know, be, to be interviewed, call news conferences, put out press releases, uh, lobby, pol lobby governments, lobby politicians, inform oppositions and governments. You, you, you must do all of that. And by the way, governments know that. I mean, e even the Abbott government, um, while uh, you know, didn't dismantle you know, uh, universities and, 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 and the CSIRO, it might have started in some ways, um, and, and there's an argument about all of that. Um, but it's always a vexed, a vexed issue, though, in other areas as well. Now, for example, I was talking with Fran just before I came down here about doing something on the program tomorrow about the homophobia that's been unleashed by the review into the Safe Schools program and also uh, the plebiscite on same-sex marriage, which is being promised for after the election. Now, there's been concerns that this is going to uh, engender a lot of anti-gay, anti-lesbian rhetoric in the community. And we're already seeing some pretty vile pamphlets being distributed and groups helping young LGBTI kids noting a, a tick up in people going to them for help. So we want to cover that and you know, we can put anyone on to, to criticise homophobia, but then th the people who are saying this, misguided as they are, they may just be representing a certain part of society which is concerned about marriage equality, is concerned about what's been taught their kids in the program. 
So how do we approach it? Well, I guess my job when I leave here today is to try and find uh, someone who's a little bit homophobic, but not too homophobic. <laughs> so, you know, it's not going to be too extreme because we don't want to give them a megaphone, but, you know, to an extent, they are entitled to have their views expressed on the program. Mm. Um, we had another question. Uh, there's a, could we get a mic uh, to the lady with her hand up there, please? Oh, sorry, here, while we're waiting, thank you. <coughs> A uh, very quick one. I'll go back to that archaic uh, media art form called print. <laughs> and What's that? <laughs> and I've, uh, as someone who's bought probably every issue of the uh, Saturday paper, Paul, I was, I was wondering how that's cutting through because there recently have been some, for example, with the South Australian Royal Commission into the nuclear fuel cycle, you had an article two weeks about that which was a beautifully balanced piece. So is that... Is that particular Saturday paper cutting through? It's often got some good considered articles. Well, the Saturday paper, again, is, is going to... It's longer-form journalism. It's, it's um, a, a weekly, so it's not a daily um, uh, paper. And, and, and its audience is what they call the AB demographic, that is higher income, higher education. And it's doing all right in that niche. And the point about that is that it is therefore... Uh, reaching out to what you might also call not so much the grocery buyers, that's what Channel 10 News does, but it's reaching out to the decision makers. And that niche is working, it's actually paying for itself. Maury Schwartz, who owns Black Ink, publisher of the monthly, the qu uh, quarterly essay and the Saturday paper, is an interesting guy. He's a child Holocaust survivor and a multi-millionaire Jewish property developer. And he's decided that there does need to be this sort of voice, you know, in, in the Australian marketplace of ideas. So we can be very grateful for, to Maurice Schwartz because his other publications, including Black Ink, um, if he wasn't there, they probably wouldn't exist. It's OK for the media to be campaigning. It's OK to have a, a left-wing newspaper or a left-wing radio network because there's plenty of balance and diversity in the Australian media market. And people tend, I mean, as consumers and readers and viewers, people tend to choose which one they want to listen to or read. Of course. Yeah. yeah look, there's one thing that really bugs me, um, and that is that we do, we really are getting into camps of left and right, you know. Whatever happened to looking at an issue and dissecting it and, uh, you know, we, we, you know, from a point of view, obviously, of a value system and saying, on this issue, I'm conservative, on this issue, <laughs> you know, I'd like to see change, you know. Um, and I think it's just so easy to, uh, you know, reject things as, oh, that's left or that's right. Um, I mean, one of the things well, I most welcome... Tag. Yeah, I know, I know, it's convenient. You know, one of the things I welcome, and I, ha and I actually wish him success, with the arrival of Turnbull on the scene... Uh, even though, uh, and I've written this today on the new, the new Daily, you know, Tony Abbott's running around telling his mates that the trouble with Turnbull is he's very left. Well... He but, was. Well, I'd, no, but I'd hope to say, well, you know, does that mean intelligent? Does that mean to say that, that you know, you can, you can question things, you can, you know, run certain things out? But this idea of political correctness annoys me no end. Uh, what do we want to be? Do we want to be free to denigrate? You know, do we want to be free to um, to undermine the cohesion of of a pluralist society? Well, if it's politically correct to say no, hate speech is not acceptable. Um, uh, why why should that be left or right? I just don't I don't I don't understand that. Once, for example, in this whole debate on gay marriage, once we accept that that people's um, sexual orientation doesn't affect their dignity or rights as a human being, you know, it, it then challenges the whole way we shape the debate. Mm. Uh, another question here, thank you. Hi, my name is Molly Hoke. I'm from the Society of Toxicology and Chemistry. Um, I was, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering what do you see in terms of those minority views or opposing views when you're trying to find balance in a debate, maybe on radio or television, uh, what do you see as the responsibility of the media to give a voice to those points of view? How much do you think that's important? 
Well, it, look, it all depends on how representative the point of view is. Now, you sometimes get total nut job candidates for election, election candidates, who think they, they should have the same right as the Prime Minister for airtime or being on the Channel 10 bulletin in the newspaper. Well, if they're so extreme that they represent pretty much just themselves, then they don't have any right at all. So it, I, I can't explain to you exactly where the cutoff point is, but they have to be representative of a fair chunk of society or a, a, a fair chunk of a particular point of view to be given airtime. Did you have anything to add to that point? No, it, it, it is a difficult issue. Um, like, it's easy enough to say, well, you know, uh, you, you should give the Labor Party a fair, a fair go and you should give the Liberal Party a fair go. I mean, that's easy because the, then you get a spokesman, spokesperson for the Liberal Party or, or for the Labor Party. Although, that, that's not as easily said than uh, done. About four elections ago, a complaint was lodged with Channel 10 by... Um, the Liberal Secretariat that my coverage of that election was biased. Anyway, they did, I was audited. And uh, the audit came back and found that, by and large, Bongiorno's coverage was quite balanced. If anything, it did tilt to one side, but that one side was the Liberal side. And that's because they uh, gathered that I gave three more sound bites in that. Uh, you know, a four-week, five-week campaign, three more to the Liberals than I gave to the Labor Party, which is a sort of a strange way of sorting bias out. Like, for example, if I put someone from the Labor Party on who's attacking their own leader in the middle of an election campaign, the Liberal Party should send me a cheque and thank me. <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. True. Uh, we had one over here somewhere. Oh, sorry, right over there. Paul. Yeah, uh, Paul Willis from Australia's Science Channel. Uh, it must have been about 20 years ago that then Science Minister Barry, Evans, uh, Barry Jones, uh, I'm wearing his beard today, um, <laughs> he uh, pronounced that scientists were the wimpiest bunch of lobbyists he'd ever come across. Now, <laughs> in your uh, humble opinions, has anything changed? Well, Are well, scientists... Course. Of sorry? course, at the Australian Academy of yeah. Science, we're, we're not wimps at all, but sorry. No, no but uh, in the last 20 years, have scientists become more effective at telling their story, at being able to have. influence the, uh, the debate? Yeah, well, I think a really good example of that is last year when Chrissy Pine, as the science minister, was def or the education minister, was defunding, what was the program called Enchris. again? NCRIS. that's right. And, I mean, that was going to wreak, you know, quite a lot of damage on scientific, a whole variety of scientific research projects. I don't know if Brian Schmidt's still in the room, but um, Brian Schmidt, he was a very, very forceful advocate defending that program, and they backed down. So, go scientists. Mm. And it, it does seem now that the, um, the new uh, head of the CSIRO is finding out how ANSI scientists can be and, and, what, support, um, and what support there is out there. Uh, we have a story, uh, to their own. story, a question at the back. It might be a story if we're lucky. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nick Tierney. I'm from the Stats Society of Australia. Um, I find sometimes you have a discussion or an argument with someone and it might end with, uh, well, that's my opinion. And that sort of has a hidden assumption of which is equally valid. How do you think you handle that approach of someone's opinion versus their argument? Because I've heard sometimes in some classes at university, the lecturer stands up and says, no one's entitled to their opinion, you are entitled to your argument. This is sort of touching on the previous point over there. Well, I think, uh, I think you're entitled to both as far as the mainstream media is concerned. I think, uh, I think we deal a lot more with argument. We, do, we don't do talk back, unfortunately. I'd love to get some talk back into our program. I used to work in commercial radio and <laughs> that was the bedrock and that was all opinion, <laughs> not <laughs> argument. But it'd be nice to have a balance. Yeah. One of the problems with talkback radio, Alison, as I'm sure you'll agree, is that they have a producer that only puts to air the talkback views that he or she wants to uh, put to air. Well, that's very cynical, Paul. I used, to be, <laughs> I used to be that person who would pick up the phone and put the calls through to Neil Mitchell. Well, I, 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 yeah. was, picked up, I was picked up last year by a cab driver who was, um, had been in Australia. He was an Egypt, Egyptian Muslim. And he said, I listen to Alan Jones all the time and I keep ringing and they never put me on. And I said, cause, <laughs> and I said that's because you made the mistake of saying what you want to talk to him about. <laughs> uh, we've got time for just two more questions. There's one at the back there. 
You mentioned that as the media, you have a responsibility to provide balanced reporting if there's a significant fraction of um, any group that holds a view. Do you think there's a point where social good outweighs that? I, I think about the issue like vaccinations is a big one. There certainly is a vocal minority um, who continue to get a voice, I don't not necessarily they, yeah. in the public interest. Yeah, I don't know if the anti-vaxxers get much of a voice in the mainstream media, so they might do most of their campaigning through social media. We wouldn't put an anti-vaxxer on. Likewise, we would never do anything that could possibly undermine you know, the defence of the realm, national security. That's a, another area where we do have to consistently be vigilant that we are not doing anything to, to undermine security. Again, it's, it's not a clear case. There's a lot of grey in what you're saying, and I think Alison's answer uh, points, uh, points that out. Um, there is no doubt that uh, not all arguments have the same weight. Um, opinions can in the sense that it's a free country and you're entitled to your opinion. But um, one of the things I think, and RN does Apart this... from the Egyptian taxi driver. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, one, one of the things that, um, uh, that we have to be careful of these days is that a blogger uh, is free to uh, express his or her prejudices all the time. Uh, one would hope that a journalist or a commentator as a, as a journalist um, would at least give the reasons for his or her analysis. So, you know, if you're concluding that politician A uh, has stuffed up, it's not because you just don't like him or his party or her or her party, it's because they've actually stuffed up for these reasons. Last question, thank you. Hello, my name's Bill Gladstone from UTS in Sydney. Um, I've engaged with the media in the past on questions around the science of marine conservation. And one of the things that startled me early on was the heat in the that turned from science into a public debate and the attacks that directed at me and my colleagues that were totally unexpected. I, I interacted naively and objectively to say, I'm presenting the science here, but I found that we were attacked from all sorts of sectoral interests. And being a shy, introverted scientist, I just didn't know how to, to deal with it. So what, the Fisher's party got stuck into you? Didn't Very they? much so. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of my advice to, and I'd like your, to hear your opinion about this or advice, but in terms of our advice for younger scientists who are firstly engaging in, in hot topics, is the necessary, the need to be resilient to this and just to stick with the science and be prepared for these sort of attacks that, that do happen from, from vested interest groups. I, I think the heat's gone out, out of that though. I mean, I, I know what you're talking about, but you know, during the height of the debate on climate change, I mean, there were certainly some terrible stories of scientists, I think even receiving death threats, for goodness sake, if they dared present the evidence about that particular issue. I would hope that, that we now live in different times. I suspect we do. Don't shy away from fronting up, please. Please don't hide under the sea. Mm. But there is, there is some uh, help, uh, helpful advice I got years and years ago when I had hair and was younger. Um, and that is, if you're doing your job conscientiously and you're secure in yourself, this is an important thing, you've got to accept yourself and what, what you've become through hard work and study and through the interaction, um, you know, uh, with your peers, the arguments, the disagreements, the way you've formulated your own opinion, uh, so that when people do attack you, and sometimes they can get quite personal, um, you, you can let it bounce off you, if you get what I mean. Like, if I took notice, I mean, I do block some, but I, I don't block many. If I took notice of all the hate I get on Twitter, you know, I, I'd be a wreck. Um, when I was in, in Brisbane for a few years, I was doing investigative journalism and on one particular story that took me about three or four months to do, you know, ambulances were turning up at our place at one o'clock in the morning, you know. Um, there were threats that you better take your children to school personally because we'll kidnap them, all that sort of rubbish, you know. You knew that a lot of this was just intimidation. You, you have to, you know, you don't, don't be naive. But, but, um, but, but if, but if you're uh, personally secure in 
what you are and who you are, and hopefully if you have a supportive, intimate relationship and all of that sort of stuff, um, all of that stuff out there can just bounce off the walls. Don't be precious petals might mm. be the message there. Well, you can, um, be, a, you can be a precious petal, but, but to be, um, you know, but, but you just need to be more, um, uh, you know, uh, more assured of, of, the, of, if you're assured of yourself, I think all of that argy-bargy uh, really counts for little, you know. Thanks. Um, I'd like to end with a short plug. If you want to hear more about science in the media and indeed more science itself in the media, please come along to or tune in to the National Press Club address on the 30th of March. We have three outstanding nationally recognised Australian scientists uh, speaking about science on that day and um, I, I think it'll be a really fascinating address. Uh, but for now, I would like to say a very big thank you to our guests, Paul Bongiorno, Alison Carabine. Thank you very much. Thank you.